Good afternoon. That was a nice little break, wasn't it? I didn't realize there was beer out there until about two minutes ago. I feel gypped. So how, how are you guys enjoying Prague so far? Good? Hands up if you enjoyed the conference so far. Hands up if you didn't. That's a good sign. All right. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about object-oriented design, object-oriented programming. How many here, show of hands, how many of you practice object-oriented programming right now? That is awesome. How many of you have heard of object-oriented programming? OK. And how many of you have no clue what it is? Be honest. Wow, nobody. That's impressive. Yeah, well, I'll give you a hint. If you don't know what it is, you're going to have an easier time with the first part of this talk. So there's this question. What is an object? And I think most people get this wrong. And I think that the way that we teach object-oriented programming is wrong. So let's go through this for a second. In the classic view, in what we teach in textbooks and you know, articles online, they try to equate this notion of an object or a class to some kind of a physical thing. Your methods make that physical thing do something, and then your properties describe that physical thing. So you can have a car class, and this car class has a method called drive, and a method called start, and a method called stop. And the properties are the car is red, the car is a you know, Ferrari, the car is manual transmission, yada, 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 all the way down the line. And this is popular because it allows you to conceptualize. You interact with a car, maybe not a Ferrari, but you interact with a car every day. You don't interact with these magic things called objects. So by equating one to one, we can kind of mentally make a map. And that's why people think this is a good idea. So we usually wind up with a tree like this. How many people have seen something like this before? Pretty much everybody. You have this inheritance tree, this hierarchy, where you have an interface animal, and then mammal extends from animal, and then cat extends from mammal, and then lion extends from cat. Makes sense, right? Kind of, maybe, not really. Let's look at what a lion is. Let's talk a little bit about this lion. In classic code, we may have something like this. Does this make sense? Does everybody understand this or have seen something like this before? Well, this raises a couple questions. Is it realistic? Have you ever seen real application code that looks like this? I know I haven't. And the reason is, let's dissect this. What does it mean to make a new lion? What does that first line mean? I could go digging through the source code, but mentally, in my mind, I think you need two lions in about nine months to make a new lion. So when you call new, what does that mean? I have no idea. OK, what does it mean to make a lion roar? Is there some magic button somewhere on the lion where if I press it in just the right way, he'll start roaring? What does it mean for an object to hunt? We can probably come up with a scenario where this exact code would make perfect sense. But by itself, it makes absolutely zero. Because we don't know what a lion is in relation to our ap uh, application. You need to understand the entire application in order to understand this lion and this little piece of code. And that's not what object-oriented programming is about. Object-oriented code uh, programming is about letting us ignore the rest of the application. So this classic model is very easy to understand, which turns out to be both a good thing and a bad thing because it's also completely impractical. So let's introduce a new view, the, what I'm going to term modern view, which is that an object is really a collection of related behaviors. Behavior is what we're dealing with here. Your method is the behavior that you want to interact with, and your methods are your behavior. Or I'm sorry, your methods are your behavior, and properties are the details behind that behavior. So they may be dependencies. They may be some state information you need to keep track of. The key here, though, is it's behavior that we're dealing with. In the classic view, we're talking about an object conceptually is a something. So an object conceptually is a lion. An object conceptually is a um, car. The modern view is really behaves as a. So let's 
walk through an example with some real code. Let's talk about numbers. Numbers are a pretty abstract concept. Yeah, when we think about them, we normally think about integers or um, decimals or things like that. But Roman numerals or complex numbers, there's really a lot of broad things that fit this concept of a number. So we could talk about this entire hierarchy of types of numbers and inheritance and all these things that behave as this conceptual number. But there's a difference here. We don't need inheritance to talk about object-oriented programming. That tree model is a distraction. All we need are polymorphism and encapsulation. So it's really, really simple. Polymorphism is when you have behavior that is dynamically determined. Meaning when you call a function in procedural programming, you can go look up that function name and know exactly what it does. When you write the function, you know exactly what it does. Polymorphism says, we're gonna have some kind of a variable that's gonna control where that function lives. So when you write the code that calls, it doesn't know at that point in time what's happening. It's a really, really, really simple concept. It's really difficult to explain well. So we have like a block of procedural code with that number example. And we have four different statements here, or three different. If A is a long integer, we do one thing. If it's a float, we do another. If it's a decimal, we do another. So we have this flow here. The problem comes along, what if I change, add a new type? What if I add a complex number? Or if I add a Roman numeral or something like that? Now I need to change my calling code. Whereas if we use polymorphic code, we're telling the integer what we want to happen. We're saying, hey, number, add one to yourself. I don't care how. That's not my worry. My worry is to tell you what to do. You worry about doing it. That's polymorphism. Your code looks really simple. And that's the whole point of this. We want to localize our code. And we can do the same thing with the uh, float as we did with the integer. And it really looks the same, just some minor details changed. This is something that you really need to play with to really, really get a good grasp of. Um, so I would suggest trying, just trying playing with this. Try instead of using a raw function call, try making it an object and try changing which object that is. So the other half was encapsulation, where behavior, we want to hide the information that we're dealing with. We want to hide details so we can expose abstractions. So the example here is we have a detail that five is stored in the number property of this object. If five is the value, print the number is five. If not, print the number is not five. This is dangerous because what we're really doing is we're coupling this code to the details behind how number is written. Instead, we can use a different um, concept where we don't ask, we don't ask for what your value is. We say, I want you to tell me if you're equal to, uh, to five. We're encapsulating those details. We're encapsulating the information. Make sense? So one of the reasons for this is, well, for integer and float, it's pretty easy to do. But if we wanted to do a decimal, we now have some complex storage. So that value property doesn't really exist anymore. So now our encapsulated code is safer, and we can start to deal with them as containers. Bacon. So I want to talk about APIs for a few minutes. If you were in the last talk that was in this room, Larry talked quite a bit about APIs, um, Krell. I want to talk about APIs at a fundamental level. There's really two fundamental types of APIs. You have an interface, which is what they're called in PHP, which is what they're called in Java, where, and Go, and a whole bunch of other languages, which is an explicit API. It's saying, I'm going to give you an object that implements this interface, which means it's going to have these three methods that hopefully do what we promise them to do. The point being is that it's explicit. It's just as if you signed a contract that says, I guarantee this code is going to do what I say it's going to do. 
The other type is duck typing, which is if it looks like a duck, it's probably a duck. You pass in a object, we expect it to have a particular method. If it doesn't have a method, we're just gonna error out. We don't care about the contracts. We don't care about um, the explicitness of it. Now, to be completely fair, I used to be a interface everything person. If you talked to me two, three years ago, interfaces are the way to go, duct typing is stupid, why would you do that? Today, I'm very much in the middle. A lot of my code does have interfaces, a lot of my code doesn't. It's really different tools for different, uh, different uses. So now, this raises a question. If an object is a collection of behaviors, what is a collection of objects? What is a collection of classes? As it turns out, we have, what's, um, we have a fractal design, a fractal pattern coming out here. We have a method, which we've already said is behavior, right? Well, collection of methods is a class or an object, which is just behaviors. Well, what are a collection of classes? Well, we can roll up related classes or related behavior into a package. And we can roll up related packages into a library and we can roll up re related libraries into a framework. Now, this happens every day in Drupal code. You have a method or a function that you roll up into maybe a file um, or classes in uh, some Drupal 7 code, some Drupal 7 modules. You have a couple classes that wind up becoming a package. And an example of this would be, let's say you have an admin section to your module, and you have an admin component within your module that you install. That would be a package. It's a collection of responsibilities, it's a collection of behaviors that have a single purpose. Then you collect a couple of those things, you wrap it up into a library that you call a module. And then you wrap up a whole collection of modules and you call it a um, distribution or eventually a framework like Drupal, which is nothing more than a collection of modules. Now the reason I bring this up, and the reason that I'm kind of droning on a little bit about this, all of object-oriented design and the power of object-oriented design is that we can treat a single object the same way we treat an entire library or entire application. All of the things that we're gonna talk about today are just as applicable at the top level as they are at the bottom level and everywhere in between. And good object-oriented code lets you forget about the bottom half and just worry about what you wanna worry about. So now what? Let's talk about what makes a good API. A good API does one thing. Simple. A good API never changes. Has anyone here worked with the Facebook APIs? Have you magically seen them stop working one day? Bad. A good API doesn't change. If it works today, it should work tomorrow. A good API does what it says it does. It behaves like its contract. A good API has a narrow responsibility. Now, the first one in this one, the single responsibility and narrow responsibility sound like they contradict, or why would you need both? Well, let's say we had a class, and we're gonna say its responsibility is to be Drupal. That's a pretty wide responsibility. You're gonna wind up with a gigantic class. Whereas here, we can say you do one thing, and being a CMS may be one thing, but that one job should be very, very, very narrow. It should be very focused. A good API depends upon abstractions, because we want APIs to talk to each other. We don't want to depend upon implementation details. And that's really solid. That's what the acronym solid is all about. That's what good object-oriented code is all about. So let's go back through these one by one and dive a little bit more in deep. So a good API does one thing. In solid terms, this is known as the single responsibility principle. Relatively straightforward. Now, imagine I come to you and I say, you're an um, industrial designer, or you're a, uh, a mechanical engineer, and I say, I want a multi-tool. Okay, what's a multi-tool? Well, I want every tool I could possibly need into one device. You may wind up with something like this which is really only good at two things. There's tweezers in there in case you get a splinter, and it's good as a paperweight to indicate that you have far too much money to spend. Instead, 
you can have narrow focused responsibilities where you have a set of different hammers and every single hammer is designed for its job. It has one reason for being. And this is what we want our objects to be. We want them to have one reason for being, one reason for changing. A good API never changes. More formally, the open-closed principle. Objects should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So if you were gonna put on a hat, would you do brain surgery? Probably not, you put on the hat. But now we can put on two hats and we can do a whole bunch of things. And we see this with Photoshop a lot. You have a picture, and someone decides, well, we want to extend this picture. So they make Karl Marx. And then someone else comes along and says, you know what, no, we need a superhero programmer, so they make Bat Programmer, which then becomes kind of a problem because Photoshop has a tendency of reoccurring in real life, and then you get this. But that's kind of a distraction. So continuing on, the next one you have is Liskov Substitution Principle. Fancy name, really, really, really simple concept. This is a US outlet, circa 1920. Two prongs, you get electricity from one, it returns on the other. The old European plug is basically the same thing. Well, this worked fine for 20 or 30 years until all of a sudden they realized, hey, you know what? We need a ground pin, we need a third pin. So rather than making a new plug, which a lot of people did, they decided we're gonna extend this. We're gonna add a separate pin. So now anything that the parent could accept, all plugs that worked on the parent still work on the child. But we've added functionality. That's what the least cost substitution principle is. When you're gonna change something, change it so it still works like the original, but add in the new functionality on the side. And then you get crazy little contraptions like this. The interface segregation principle. We want a narrow API, we want a narrow interface. If we wanna design a multi-tool that is a, you know, keep in your pocket and use it, you keep each interface, each thing that it does, very narrow, very well-defined. Make it easy to use, make it easy to understand. And finally, a good API depends upon abstractions. Well, what does that mean? I'm hoping most people have seen a screwdriver like this, where you have these, all these different bits. This is really interface, um, sorry, this is really dependency inversion at its heart. You have the handle, which is a detail, that I'm gonna use my hand to turn, that's a detail. It depends upon this socket over here as an abstraction. So really, those two are connected. Then each one of these bits has a detail at one end and an abstraction at the other. And when the two abstractions meet, you have a useful tool. And you can swap either side out, you can swap in different bits. We wanna depend, we want our code to interact with abstract concepts. And you can tell if an abstraction is good if it's reusable. So these very same bits work just as well in a hand screwdriver as they do in a machine gun. So that's solid. Remembering the names is harder than remembering the principles. It's really, really simple and really straightforward. And it's useful to note that solid doesn't dictate what good object-oriented code is. Good object-oriented code tends to be solid. Solid tends to emerge from good object-oriented code. This is really something that takes time. You have to write a lot of code. You have to play with a lot of code. You have to look at a lot of code to really, truly understand this stuff. And that's what I suggest you do. Try it, play around with it, write some objects, write some simple little libraries, and play. Because playing is fun. And we all deserve a little fun. So what makes a bad API? We've talked about good APIs and solid. Let's talk about a little bit about bad code. Global variables are bad. Spooky action at a distance. Um, there's a story about a guy who came in to test a uh, payment gateway, a payment system, like a uh, shopping cart. And he's testing the credit card validation logic. 
Nothing else, just the little piece of code that validates the credit card. So he's like, well, I need a credit card number. I have my credit card number. Let me just put my credit card number in there. And because of the way the application was structured, he had to put a, pr a price on it, so he put 10 cents. Ran the test, it passed, everything came back green. Okay, great, I'm fine, I go off, I do my other thing. A Couple weeks later, he checks his credit card bill, and he's got several thousand dollars worth of charges. He goes, what the heck is going on? And he notices there are all these little 10 cent transactions. What he realized is he started going through the code, and the validation logic actually charged his credit card. What should have been a regular expression or something else actually had spooky action in that it did something that he didn't realize was gonna happen. Global variables are bad. Depending on the specifics of an implementation is bad. We wanna depend upon details, we wanna, I'm sorry, we wanna depend upon abstractions. Hidden dependencies, similar to spooky action at a distance, hidden dependencies are a problem. An unhealthy focus on performance. Now this does not mean performances does not matter. This means performance only matters after the other important things are checked off. Poorly named APIs, we want names to be good, we want names to be readable. And duplication is a problem. So that's stupid. Now again, let's go back through each one. So singletons. Singletons are not object-oriented code. Let me say that again. Singletons are not object-oriented code. Singletons are global variables. They're procedural code that some people think are object-oriented because it uses objects. It's not. They're a problem. So to explain this, how many people know what this is? Lord of the Rings. So the backstory on this ring I find fascinating because it really is singletons and what singletons are. This dark lord, decided one day that he was gonna cra craft a whole bunch of rings of power. He gave, and I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, but three to the elves, five to the dwarves, and seven to men, or something like that. And he gave them to them as gifts. And in secret, he crafted this ring to control all of those others that he gave out. So each one of the individual actors, each one of the men and dwarves and elves, got this ring that they were saying, okay, this makes me powerful but there was a spooky action, there was a singleton in the background, which was this ring controlling it. Singletons are not a good idea. We want flexibility. We don't want hidden control. Tight coupling. We don't want to depend upon specifics. We want to depend upon abstractions. So if we're gonna build a car, and we need to make an um, exhaust manifold, we don't custom make an exhaust manifold at least unless it mates up in a standard way. Because what happens if it breaks? What happens if it's no longer suiting your needs? You can't go and take one off the shelf. You have to completely rebuild it. And that's kind of some of the part of the problems that you'll see in code, is that when you go to try to fix something small over here, if you're too tightly coupled, something big breaks over here. Wait a minute, I changed something in the user profile and search broke. How, why are those two things connected in the first place? Untestable code. We don't want to have hidden dependencies. We want to have our code written in such a way that's easily testable. Now, I'm a kind of a, like a half of a space nut, so I'm gonna use a really, really interesting story here. This is the lunar lander. This is what got um, humanity to the moon in 1979. 69, thank you, I'm sorry. The fascinating thing about this is dependency and reliability was key. They had quality assurance programs, QA testing, through the wazoo. They tested every part over and over again. They tested every design over and over again. What we talk about when we talk about unit testing, these guys were doing 40, 50 years ago to a degree way beyond what we are even capable of thinking about. But there was a problem, because reliability mattered more than anything else. This engine on the bottom here was what's known as a hypergolic engine which meant that it has two valves. Those are the only moving parts. You open the valves, propellant comes out, mixes in the combustion chamber, and bursts into flame and explodes. Which means that the engine is incredibly reliable. As long as those valves turn, 
you take off, which is great for safety. The problem came is that these fuels are incredibly corrosive. So what wound up happening is when they built the engine, they ran the engine, and then they had to completely tear down, throw away the old one, and build a new one. So how would you test something like that? You know, you're, you're looking at this engine where human lives are going to be at stake every single time it fires, and you can't test it because you can't fire it without rebuilding it. Now, there's steps that you can take. You know, we could, let's say, run water through it, put pressurized water in the tanks and make sure everything flows right. We could um, double check the valves. We can, you know, there's steps that we can take and there's tests that we can do without actually testing the system. And that's kind of what I want to get across here. All your code doesn't need to be 100% unit tested. There's going to be some parts of your code that are going to be difficult to test. The point is you want to take enough action, you want to test it enough to where you're comfortable that it's not going to break, especially the more critical parts. It's not going to always be worth it to refactor, but it's always worth it to be safe. So premature optimization, an unhealthy focus on performance. Imagine, if you will, you own a motorcycle shop. And I come into your shop and I say, I want you to build me a custom fast motorcycle. And you go in your back and say, hmm, he wants a fast motorcycle. So let me get the most powerful engine I can and stick it on two wheels. And you wind up with something that looks like this, which is a Dodge Viper muscle car engine, 500 horsepower, can do somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to 800 kilometers per hour in a straight line, and can't turn. This is what happens when you think about performance before you think about all of your other responsibilities and all of your other priorities. What about maintainability? What about extensibility? Think about performance when performance matters. Don't think about performance when other things are a priority. Indescriptive naming. I hope this one is obvious. Do I need to really go deeply into this one? I will ask one question, though. How many of you would drink this soda? And finally, duplication. Luckily, duplication is one that the programming industry has been harping on for five, ten years now with dry, don't repeat yourself. So be careful when you copy and paste all the things. There is one caveat, though, and this is more of a personal anecdote. I personally practice what I call the rule of three, which means I will copy and paste something once because I typically don't know enough about what I'm copy and pasting to actually abstract or refactor or do anything. So I'll copy and paste once. The second I need it a, th a second time, the second I need it in a third place, that's when I stop, I refactor, and I deduplicate. It's a trick that I've been, trying, I've been playing around with for a couple of years, and it works incredibly well for me. Give it a shot. So that's stupid. Any questions at this point? Yay. So stupid, stupid embodies lessons learned from bad object-oriented code. Straightforward. So let's, good object-oriented code gives you a whole bunch of things. It gives you modularity. It gives you extensibility. It gives you easy to read and easy to understand code. It gives you clean abstractions, hopefully. But it all comes at a cost. Or it actually all comes at a lot of costs. A lot of times we've heard in procedural programming of this uh, phenomenon called spaghetti code, where it, it, the code is so convoluted and the flow is so convoluted that it's hard to keep track of where all the pieces go. In object-oriented programming, we have a concept very similar called lasagna code. It's code that is so layered, it has so many abstractions that it's impossible to understand. It tends to be slower at runtime. This is not as big of a deal as most people make it out to be, because what you lose at runtime, you save at developer time. Well, why would we want to save developer time? Well, I don't know about here, but in the US, a developer costs a lot of money, and a server costs a little amount of, a little amount of money. I'd rather throw 10 servers at a problem than one developer. Now, obviously, that depends upon what you're talking about. That depends on the project. but. 
we're talking trade-offs, we're not talking absolutes. And it tends, the other really big thing that I think most people, when they talk about object-oriented code that they miss, is it requires a lot of tacit knowledge. And what that means is, if you look at a brand new code base that someone else wrote, it takes you a long time to spin up. And this is very true, actually, it's incredibly topical at this point, with Drupal 8. A lot of people, when they first look at 8, right now, today, are gonna go, huh? I don't get this. This makes absolutely no sense. And in fact, you're hearing people saying that over and over again. You're seeing it on Twitter. You're hearing it at this conference. The difference is, once you learn how that code was written, once you learn the patterns that it uses, once you learn the conventions, and there's a lot of overhead. This is not something that you're gonna do in a day or two. Once you learn the principles, all of a sudden, everything opens up, everything makes sense, and the entire system will magically be not simple, but relatively easy to understand. But that tacit knowledge, that knowledge of how things are structured is often overlooked by people. And that is a valid cost of object-oriented programming. It's also a cost of all other kinds of programming, but let's leave that aside. So let's look at some code. We've come this far talking about cars and random things. Let's actually look at some code. Hey, we're looking at a car code. <laughs> let's imagine for a minute that we're building a computer uh, program that's going to drive a car. So you're gonna s put this program in control of the steering wheel and the gas pedal and you're gonna make it drive. How would you interface with that car? Well, you might do something like this where you have a turn right method, a turn left method, a go faster, go slower, all these different methods that are in the same interface. And on the surface, this looks pretty straightforward. But let's think about solid. What is the responsibility of this class, or of this interface? Well, it's to navigate, it's to accelerate, it's to shift, wait, that's weird, and it's to start. That, that seems like it's trying to do a lot of things, and it is. Is it open to extension? What if we want to change the transmission? Can we? I don't know. In fact, if we went through this, almost every single one of the solid principles would be violated here. So let's try to refactor this. Let's try to make this simpler. In fact, let's split this up into three different interfaces. Let's make a steerable interface. So we could now plug in a car. We could plug in a remote-controlled car. We could plug in a boat, we could plug in an airplane. All we care about is that we can control the direction. We can go left or we can go right within some angle of 360 degrees. We have an acceleratable interface. The car is acceleratable because it can accelerate and it can decelerate and we can shift it. The point here is not that we change things around. The point is that we simplified our access of it and we're conceptualizing things differently. We're thinking in terms of how will we interact, what's the behavior we're expecting versus what is the system we're expecting. But you know what? Enough with this. Let's actually look at some real, real, real world code that's currently in Drupal 7. Mail system interface. Anyone here familiar with this? Okay, quite a few. Very, very, very simple interface. It has two methods, right? This should be simple, this should be good code, right? Okay, what's the responsibility of this class? Well, it needs to format a message because we can't format a message until we try to send it. So as part of your sending it, we're gonna format it and you know, replace um, BB code or markdown with HTML and do all that other fun stuff. Then we've got to encode it because emails require that emails are encoded properly. Then we have to put the headers together because we need to know from and to and all of this other stuff. Then we need to actually physically send the mail. And we also have to set some PHP INI settings. This seems weird. This seems like it's trying to do a lot. Is it open for extension? What if we wanted to change how it was emailed? Well we're gonna have to copy and paste. That's a problem. That's what we're trying to solve. 
Least cost substitution principle kind of is okay here. I'm sure we could find a problem with it, but you can find a problem with it in any code. So, but it has one interface and many responsibilities. We want narrow, not wide. And what dependencies does this have? Or I don't know. If you look through it, you can find a bunch, but we're not told anywhere what ha what's happening. So instead, why don't we split this apart into three separate interfaces? A message formatter, which formats a message. Its only job is take an email, render it out, and format it. Then a message encoder, who encodes it to be sent. So it makes multi-parts, it adds your attachments, and it does all that stuff. It handles your headers for you. And then a transport, which actually sends it out. So we wind up with a mail system that takes three distinct dependencies, your formatter, an encoder, and a transport, and sends the email. Now this mail method would be ridiculously simple. It would be three lines of code. It would be format message, encode message, and transport message, or send message. Simple, and that's what our goal is. Each one of these steps is very simple, but we can exchange out each one as we need to. So if we want to, instead of sending an email to send mail, if we want to send it to a black hole because we're gonna test, or if we want to send it to a system log because we want to see what's actually being sent, or if we want to copy it to a log, this gives us the flexibility to swap out the behaviors that we're expecting with the behaviors that we need. So the final thing I want to touch on here, I'm talking, I've talked a lot today about principles. I've talked a lot about best practice. I've talked a lot about um, the good way versus the bad way. There's a final one that I want to touch on though, which is one that I've coined and one I've been preaching for a long time, which is the principle of good enough. You don't have to write the best code possible every single time. You need to write code that's good enough for your use. If you're a hockey fan, not every single goal is going to be a good, clean goal. But every time that puck crosses the line, the objective is met. Your code doesn't always have to be crystal clean. It needs to deliver business value. Don't let better be the enemy of best, or be the enemy of good. And if it works, it works. And if we could all be so lucky. So, yeah, thank you. And please uh, provide feedback. <laughs> Any questions? Come on, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, we had these three interfaces for the mail stuff, yep. and then we had the mail system, and then the mail system could itself be, an inter be implementing an interface, so yep. we would have interfaces on implementation level, and another interface that um, tells, that expresses, um, is on the user level, or on, on the level of the okay. system that uses it. So the system that uses that has a different idea of what is one thing than uh, the implementer. Okay, so the way like I would the address that is very responsibility simple. principle is different if you look uh, depending where you look from. Sure, oh no, it yeah. absolutely is. And a lot of this winds up being judgment calls. But where I would say this very specific example here, the mail system is your service. That's the, con for lack of a better word, the controller. It's very thin, all it does is wire its dependencies together in an appropriate order. It doesn't really add any business logic, it doesn't really do anything substantive. Meaning, there should be no reason why you would need to swap it out. So I wouldn't create a explicit interface for this. I would leave it exactly as it is, have one implementation, and be done with it. Um, and this is the only public one that you should ever interact with. You, sh you, as a developer not working on this particular module, this particular package, should never look at the other three classes. You should never have to look at the other three classes. You should ask for a service. You should ask, give me the mail system, and have the rest of Drupal figure out okay, well, we're configured, we need to use this format or this encoder in this transport, here's your mail system, go ahead and send mail. Obviously, there are edge cases where that's not gonna happen, but we're trying to simplify here. Yeah, I was thinking of an yeah. example in core development that uh, mm -hmm. I would disagree with some other people. Um, like the hook menu, everyone didn't like it, 
And for me, it was like a uh, hook menu. You define a lot of things, like you define a route, but you also define link and you mm -hmm. define title. And uh, then the mess happens when you send that to different subsystems, and each and these subsystems are interdependent, and that's bad. But um, people also said like this: having this in one hook is bad. And mm -hmm. I, for me, it seems like um, for the for the user or for whatever code that uses it, there is just one thing that um, has a route and a title and anything. And then for the subsystems, it, it's like different things. So it, it's not evil in itself to just have this stuff all in one hook, but just later, if you, then you have to divide it, and then you cannot have these interdependencies. That it, it really <laughs> depends on what you're looking at and what you're doing as well. I mean, there's going to be times where it's going to make sense to have it all in one hook, as you say, or when there's going to be times it makes sense to split it out into multiple. And typically, when I run into a situation like that, and I'm not sure which one is right, I'll typically implement both. So I'll have the lower three lower level systems if you need to hook into them, and then a higher level abstraction that you can use. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Come on, there's got to be questions. Please? No? Where? Don't make me beg, I'll beg. OK, we have a question over here. Um, or over there. OK, there we go. Uh, how would you do this in uh, Drupal 7? Uh, normally, you you have a lot of uh, free functions and mm -hmm. a lot of hooks. Of course, in object-oriented uh, code, it makes a lot of sense that you could do it real pretty. But in in Drupal 7, how would you do it? Okay, so I'm going to say something that I have been both praised for saying and yelled at for saying, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Drupal 7 is object-oriented. Drupal 7 uses functions. It doesn't really use classes anywhere. But if you look at the patterns and you look at how Drupal 8 is built and what it's doing, it really is object-oriented code. It is what we're talking about here. It, it, it uses design patterns, except it goes through a lot of overhead of breaking those design patterns down, breaking them apart, and putting them into functions to try to make it easy. So the canonical example, I think, of this is the hook system. The hook system is easy, right? It's just an event. Well, in object-oriented code, we have something called the observer pattern, which is literally identical to the hook system. You have something called a mediator, which is, in this case, Drupal's hook system, which says, I'm going to handle communication when an event comes in. An event comes in, OK, we're going to go through, churn it out, and then send it out to everybody who's registered to receive it. So if you were going to do this in a Drupal, 8 style, a Drupal 7 style, and I'm using air quotes, um, what you could do is break this down into three different hook systems where you have a hook, message, a hook mail format, a hook mail encode, and a hook mail transport. Or you have a registry, a variable set, where each one of these is set in a setting. So it's really just about controlling the dependencies. You can do polymorphism without objects. You can do it with variables. And Drupal 7 does a very, very good job at that. So objects help. They help organize, but they're not necessary. I believe you have one over here. So about this new uh, Drupal 8 object-oriented uh, structure, where do I find information about it? How do I learn how these different classes are there and uh, to kind of dig into it? Okay. Um, first, I will put up a disclaimer. I am not a Drupal developer. Um, I do general PHP work. I was a PHP core developer for a while. So I don't, I'm not, I don't have the authority to, ask that, to answer that question explicitly. But what I will say is sim it's based on Symfony. Symphony components are incredibly well documented and they're incredibly well designed. Start playing around with them. Start getting used to some of the conventions. Um, there's a micro framework called Silex, which lets you uh, uses some Symphony components and lets you start playing around with certain of those patterns and certain of the other components. And that'll start building the foundation for starting to dig down. You'll start to understand some of the terminology, like what is a kernel. Uh, you know, it doesn't really make sense until you start to use it. And once you start to use it, it goes, light bulb, this is simple. Why weren't we doing this before? Hopefully. Might not have it happen everywhere. I, 
Uh, my questions relate actually to what we just have on the display. This one? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's about dependency injection. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, as we are separating behaviors into separate interfaces, mm -hmm. um, sometimes you might need to know explicitly how those are supposed to work together. Yep. So would that be a case where you don't do the dependency injection via the constructor, but instead have um, explicit setters for the dependencies? Okay. I, mean, I know that's a huge debate about that, right? Mm. How you do it? Uh, there is a debate. I have a very firm stance on this debate, which is if you need the dependency to function, in this case, you absolutely need. There's no sane way of operating without all three of these they belong in the constructor. Simple as that, simple as that. If you can optionally get away without one, then yes, you could use a setter. But where I will go, if you notice the bottom link right here is a link to YouTube. I did a video talking about dependency injection. I do programming videos. I haven't done one in almost a year, I am sorry, but I will do more. Uh, but the, where I wanna go though is, this, this class right here is using dependency injection. It's not using a container, but it is using dependency injection. Does that, how do I know? That, okay, so if we look at the interface, how do we know that this is using dependency injection? And the point being is the interface is right here. This is the interface. No, it's, you have to look at the class. Um, typically, the current, Trying to think. The current best practice is to not include constructors in an interface. So really, you have to look at the class instance that you're instantiating to decide what its dependencies are. And that's actually how Symfony's dependency injection container and Zen's, uh, Zen Framework's dependency injection container work, or they can work, is that they can reflect on the class, look at the different, well, okay, you need a message formatter instance, I have that over here that you need a message encoder, I have that over here, and you need a message transport, and I have no idea how to make that, so I'm gonna throw up. So, okay. Any other questions? Any other comments, side remarks? No? Well, thank you. Oh, did we? Yeah, we have one more over here. If I Right, you mentioned that singleton in most cases is a bad thing. Um, according to my experience, sometimes some things better to express as a singleton. I don't know, for example, like HTTP request. Uh, can you please give a bit more extended comment? Sure. What wrong with singleton if, if you initiated it properly? Okay, so you. let me take a slightly different example first and then I'll come back to that one. Let's say you use the most common use of a singleton, which is a database connection. Database, colon, colon, get instance. Great, right? So you go along and your entire application is built using this, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, wait a minute. I need to refactor, so now I have two different database connections, one for reading and one for writing. And this seems like a really weird thing to do, except when we come down to performance sharding and to replication, we may actually very well need to do that. So that way we can read from different read slaves and have different write slaves. If your code is written using singletons, you have to rewrite your entire application because you need information that happens before that singleton is, is called to figure out whether you need a read instance or a write instance. A lot of times you can get by with a singleton. A lot of times it will work and it will be clean and it will be easy and it will you know, just flat out work. The problem comes is when it stops working, when you have a problem that changes just enough where the singleton becomes a problem, you're now stuck with rewriting your application. Whereas if you were to use proper dependency injection or proper service location or some of the other patterns, you at least have a way of handling it without rewriting the whole application. So for the uh, request singleton, it sounds great on the top level, we only have one request, right? We're in PHP. What happens when we want to do something like HMVC or hierarchical MVC where we want to have a single page composed under multiple resources? Now we can no longer issue a sub request for that internally because we have this one request. So you wind up swapping things out in this really weird, confusing, tangled mess rather than just simply passing the information along as it needs to be. I, I completely get it. And that, this, I think a lot of it gets back to this 
which is if you're writing one off code, if you're writing code to solve a business problem, a singleton may be good enough for you. That's fine. You know, I'm not gonna stand here and say never ever under any circumstances write a singleton. But it's, it tends to be a bad design because if you let it get out of control, it'll hurt you. If you need to reuse it, it will hurt you. So, good? Okay, any final, no? All right, thank you.